Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Kathy Wiedemer, and I'm really pleased to introduce the legal panel to you this afternoon. Um, the, participating on the legal panel is something, is a benefit for our Diamond Level sponsors, and so we're really pleased to thank the Peter Angelos firm and Levy Phillips Connellsburg firms for being Diamond sponsors of the symposium, and that's who's participating today. On your right, your far right, is Andrew Cantor of the Angelos firm, and on your left is Bob Commodore from LPK. Um, in the middle is Kirk Wiedemer, and he's going to moderate the panel. And the way the conversation is going to go is Kirk's going to moderate and have a conversation with the two gentlemen, asking them a lot of legal questions that people have been asking us um, for the first 20 minutes, and then we're going to open up for questions from the audience. So I'll give it to you, Kirk. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I, I think um, it's probably, Kathy, it's probably best to start out with full disclosure. I'm Kathy's brother-in-law. Um, but um, I thought the name did sound familiar. Yeah, to I, I object. Yeah, uh, I uh, am no longer involved in asbestos litigation. But um, uh, Kathy asked me uh, to uh, moderate uh, the panel because of my previous uh, experience with asbestos litigation. Uh, just one uh, major ground rule that I would like to mention, and that is, uh, everybody here has. Uh, a case or at least an interest in meso mesothelioma litigation. And we will have a very uh, spirited discussion in terms of questions and answers, but we really would like people to refrain from getting into the facts of their own case because it's time consuming and also it uh, might not be ap applicable to everybody else's uh, interest or case uh, that they may have. Okay. Oh. Okay. Very good. Okay. One thing I learned uh, when I was a nurse at Mass General Hospital before I became a lawyer, I worked five years there in the, in the emergency room and in the open heart unit. And uh, one important uh, matter that I learned, or lesson that I learned uh, in my 35 years as a litigator or trial lawyer, is that when you're in the healthcare system or when you're in the litigation or legal system, you're not in control. And when you're not in control in a matter that is really important in your life, it causes a lot of anxiety. And people who have a meso case, I think have a double dose of anxiety. These two lawyers here are um, gunfighters. Uh, there are, they are experienced litigators uh, in the trench warfare known as asbestos litigation. And their purpose today is to help reduce some of that anxiety uh, by giving you information that will help guide you along the way if you already have a case or if you or your family member uh, may be uh, on the edge of bringing a case they have the experience. They have been in the battles that uh, have taught them how to uh, handle defendants law defendant lawyers and how to deal with the issues and the facts. And, and that's what we're going to concentrate on in the next uh, hour or so. Initially, they're going to uh, hit on some key points uh, regarding asbestos litigation and meso uh, litigation in particular. And then, of course, uh, uh, they will open it up uh, two questions from the floor. And Andy, I'd like to start with you. And the, the one key question that uh, people always ask is, when is the right time to seek legal counsel? Sure. Thanks, Kirk. Um, and first, let me thank Mark for having us here today, and Kathy for having us today. This is, uh, this is a truly great organization. Uh, some of our clients are probably here today helping and, and uh, as volunteers. And we certainly, on numerous occasions, have uh, referred our clients uh, to Mark for, for support, um, and also, of course, to Mary Hesdorfer for, for medical advice on occasion as well. So this is, this is a wonderful group, and, and we certainly plan to continue our devotion uh, to the group uh, in, for, for the long time to come. When to pick a lawyer? Um, it's easy to say pick one right away, because, but that is the right answer. Um, people, ha once they're diagnosed with mesothelioma, obviously have issues to deal with other than the legal process. 
but when someone is diagnosed with that disease, it does begin a legal process in terms of finding a lawyer and someone who is appropriate, someone who can help you. Uh, individuals with the disease uh, need to seek legal counsel, need to seek it quickly to help the lawyers. Uh, the lawyers who want to help the plaintiffs are in need of their help in terms of, of finding evidence, um, discussing work history, and the sooner that can be done, the better. Individuals, and we'll talk about this more, have certain limitations in terms of how long they have until they file a lawsuit. In Maryland, it may be one time period. In New York, it would be another. Um, but regardless of what the time period is, it's important, while, while somebody certainly is well and healthy, to be able to help their own cause. Uh, we represent individuals who come to us very shortly after diagnosis, and we represent individuals uh, who, uh, who come to us later, perhaps in their disease process or closer to their statute of limitations. And unfortunately, we represent individuals, families, uh, whose husbands or, or wives or even children um, have, are deceased. And it can make it more difficult without having an individual uh, before us who actually had the exposure to be able to speak to that person, to go through the details of their exposure. So generically, the answer is, from the legal standpoint, it is best to find a lawyer to seek legal advice as soon as you possibly can. And I think uh, the, a natural follow-up, uh, Bob, to, to Andy's comments, uh, is the importance of teamwork uh, between uh, the uh, client slash patient and his or her family and the law firm that represents it. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, first of all, again, let me thank uh, Mary and Kathy for doing an, an amazing job this year. Uh, I've been to a number of these conferences, and I see how it evolves over the years, and probably the, the greatest thing I see are, are the same faces coming back of, of people who have mesothelioma, and it's very uh, encouraging uh, for, for me and I think for others too. So, uh, but this year in particular, I think has been, been great. I thought the medical panel this morning was fantastic because it really, uh, I think the doctors really were addressing some of the issues that people can understand in a very understandable way. In a way, they've tried to demystify the medical uh, process and the medical issues. Uh, hopefully, Andy and I today, along with Kirk and going over these, we can help demystify the legal process a little bit because there are some complications and things that kind of people get lost in that legal process because it can become a complicated mess, and we're hopefully here to demystify it a bit. And I, and I think you're right. The very, the very first step uh, that you need is to, once you decide to bring a lawsuit and you choose a lawyer, we can maybe talk a bit later about that too, is to work with your lawyer. And I've told this to my clients many times. Um, we are here together uh, in a partnership. We are here together to work on your case. And so if, if a client says to me, well, look, uh, here's my information, and just, you know, just let me know when it's over. It's, it's not that way. For the same way that you work with your doctor, your doctor can't uh, treat you uh, while you're home, you've got to go to your doctor and you've got to work with him. And when your doctor says, okay, I, you, I've done the surgery, you go home, and this, these are the medications you have to take, and this is what you have to do. A lawsuit's no different in that respect. We have to work together in developing your case. So uh, lawyers will ask family members and, and people with the mesothelioma um, to go through their entire history. And by the way, and I know Andy, you do the same thing, we start with someone from just about after birth. We say, okay, let's start when you were a few years old. Where did you live? And are your parents still alive? If they're not alive, do you have an older sibling that can help? And there are so many aspects to a case in terms of where exposure can be. And there are two things um, that, I, that I think most plaintiff lawyers agree on that do this kind of work. One, that there really is no other cause of mesothelioma. Put another way, if someone has been diagnosed with mesothelioma, there should be somewhere in that history of life exposure to asbestos. That doesn't mean that we can always find it, but we look for it because I don't believe there's any non asbestos related mesotheliomas. I just think there are those that are considered idiopathic, and if you speak to the defense lawyers, they say there's a huge percentage of idiopathic, which means no known cause, mesotheliomas. I don't believe that. I just believe 
that those idiopathic mesotheliomas are those where we have not yet been able to pinpoint where the exposure is. So that's why you must work with a family to make sure that you go from age two all the way to about, and, we, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a question about uh, the latency period. How far up do you go? So if someone came to us um, in 2012 and said, look, I just passed by a building and it looked like they were taking asbestos out of there and I was just diagnosed with mesothelioma. Can you check that building out? Well, it's not going to be from that exposure. Usually, the earliest or the, 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 the shortest latency period would be about 10 years. And, that, and that's, some doctors would question that, but it could be anywhere from 10 to 60 years before. So imagine that kind of window of potential exposures that the lawyer that you choose must look for. And again, the family and the lawyer must work together. It to seems that. to me, given that, that well, given what you just said, that it's critical to pick a law firm that has the experience and the knowledge base regarding products that had asbestos over the last 50 to 60 years. Because if you don't have that knowledge base, how can you then uh, closely uh, question the, 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 the client and investigate based on what you're told? Is that fair to say? There's, there's no question. I mean, it, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, when, when people choose a doctor, I mean, we saw some of the finest doctors here today, and we'll see them more, uh, who, who treat mesothelioma. I mean, these are the best in the world. And, and it's, it's fortunate that, that they're involved with the Mesothelioma Foundation. Uh, but there are plenty of doctors out there. But these are the ones that really know it. And people seem to know and gravitate toward finding the best specialists for their mesothelioma. But somehow, sometimes people don't necessarily do that when they find a lawyer. They'll say, oh, we'll find a lawyer. The guy knows the law. That's fine. It's really the same kind of thing. You need somebody who really has done this, who has the knowledge and experience to really investigate the case because it's not as simple as people would think. A lot of my clients, I don't want to interrupt you, a lot of my clients come in and they say, wait, this should be very simple. I've been diagnosed with mesothelioma and I know I was exposed to asbestos. So when are they going to write me the check? It's not so simple. Yeah. It's actually a very complicated process and that's one reason to stress that the process should be begun uh, as early as possible in the process uh, when someone is diagnosed to see an attorney as, as quickly as possible. Uh, uh, the process entails legal discovery. Uh, it includes uh, significant investigation in most instances. When someone comes to our office, and I should have added this before, mm -hmm. even though it's important to come as early as possible, we're still typically able to successfully proceed cases for people who come later on in the process or for the families of victims who have passed away. Uh, but the reason it's important to come in, and someone may come in and say, look, I don't know where I had my exposure. I can't help you. But you can help us, because even though you think you may not have had exposure, as Bob said, we'll take you from birth on, and we'll try and figure out where you may have had exposure, where you may not think it was exposure, but we do. And then we can take those portions of your, your work history, your family history, and we can try and investigate that. So we don't expect someone to come into our office detailing what products they were exposed to on any given day or know anything necessarily about their own exposure, but we want to have the opportunity to speak to, the, to each, of, each person uh, as fully as we can to develop and investigate the case, uh, which really can be a very detailed, complex process. I how think many, it, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, was, I, I just wanted to yep. ask a, a follow-up to that. Yep. Is how important uh, is the information from family members? It's critical, and we use it all the And the, the role time. they play. We don't only talk to the person who may have the disease process. We'll begin a process by talking to any family members. We want to know about where they live, whether or not there was construction in homes, whether or not there were additions to bathrooms or kitchens over time and when. We want to know where a parent may have worked or even a grandparent who may have looked or a sibling who lived in the household. There are a whole host of, of, of things of information that we're very interested in accumulating as quickly as we can in the process. I do want to emphasize again, right. even though we say it's important to come in as early as possible, we do very successfully prosecute cases where that information is not available to us initially. The other thing, Kirk, is that a, a good law firm, just like, just like a good doctor, knows the difference between a lead and a false lead. 
A lot of times, uh, clients come in to us knowing already where their exposure was or when. That's fine, but sometimes they're absolutely wrong. And, and I, I had a case recently where a uh, gentleman was insistent that, they had, that, that, the, that this uh, service had done some uh, work at, at a property and they, and they dug up all this material and they dug it and they, and they sent it away and he said that's where it all was and it didn't sound right to me. We know that's not the way the asbestos would have been uh, handled. And, uh, but he was insistent and he, and he was close-minded about the fact that there really was nothing else. So we had to take him meticulously through it anyway. And he was reluctant because as far as he was concerned, he already found the information. Why are we not dealing with it? But as we took him through it, we found what the exposure was. And it had nothing to do with what he thought. And he was very surprised to learn that this board that he worked with most of his life, because he, he, he made Lucite products. And Lucite doesn't have asbestos. And we took him through it. But when they made the loose site, it was very hot, they put it on these boards. And every time he described it to us, he just said, yeah, we took the loose site, put it on the board anyway, and he passed it on. We said, well, wait a minute. Let's talk about those boards. No, they're just boards. Let me tell you about what was in my backyard. No, let's talk about the boards. And as we went through it with them, these boards were transite boards made out of asbestos, almost 100% asbestos. Now, the boards were made by Johns Manville. Johns Manville is bankrupt. Where did you get these boards? Well, I, I may have some documentation. Get it. The company he got the boards from, perfectly viable company. They had a full line of Manville products. They were marketing. They were not telling anybody about the dangers and their major defendant in the case. But a good lawyer has to know what is a false lead and what's a good lead. It, it is not atypical for attorneys involved in mesothelioma litigation to discover new facts and new information along the way. It may come from relatives. It may come from people who the person with mesothelioma doesn't even know, who we contact because they were on a particular job site or at a particular place at a given time that we'll talk to. Um, that happens quite frequently. Andy, what role do, the, do experts play, uh, especially if a case goes to trial? Typically, a case can't proceed without experts. Um, what kind of experts? There are causation experts. There are, are medical experts who will not only review uh, the pathology uh, of an individual, uh, but they will make determinations as to whether or not certain uh, exposures to asbestos contributed to the disease. Different states certainly have different standards as to what is required in expert testimony. And in some states, that is ever evolving even 20, 30 years or more since this litigation began. Um, and, but uh, there are experts in industrial hygiene who will analyze particular exposures to particular products. There are experts who will uh, be involved in determining whether or not someone working on boilers would have been exposed to asbestos um, while doing that type of work. Uh, again, industrial hygiene experts. There are material science experts who have analyzed various types of asbestos-containing products, whether or not it be pipe covering blocks, cement, or rope, or gaskets. These are individuals who very typically, if a case had to proceed to a trial, would be presented at trial to show their investigation, to show their tests, and to show the release of, of, of fibers. Some of the companies, and, and Bob can expand on this as well, but many of the companies that are involved in this litigation will claim that their products are, quote, encapsulated. They don't release asbestos fibers. Now, they can make that statement but since it's our burden to prove otherwise, we have to produce evidence. And we'll produce experts who have tested the products to show that that's nonsense. So there are a variety of different experts that we require uh, to bring to trial. And one other, I would add, are state-of-the-art experts. What was known when? Many of these companies had knowledge about asbestos hazards and hid them. Many of those companies that did so are now in bankruptcy, but many of them are still out there. But there are many companies that distributed, supplied asbestos-containing products that just hid their heads in the sand, literally, didn't want to know, didn't do what the law required them to do to investigate asbestos and hazards at any time. They just simply didn't want to know. And to prove what was out there when and what they should have known, we have state-of-the-art experts, people who have 
on their own investigated asbestos going back in time to the to the late 1900s and, and well before into the 1940s, 50s, and we'll describe that to a jury if need be. Well, who has the burden of proof? Well, and the, who goes first yep. if the case goes to trial? And what can the defendants do and what typically they do? And just, just let me finish by saying that when we were out in the hallway, uh, I think you mentioned that today more and more cases are going to trial than in the last uh, I, I think that's years. true. That is a multiple question, but I, I'll, I'll uh, let, me, let me break it down. Yeah. First of all, uh, there there are a lot of a lot of cases going to trial. The plaintiffs have the burden of proof, which means theoretically, uh, we have to get up first. If we can't prove our case or we don't prove our case well, the defendant could just remain mum and say. Uh, you know, we put our case on first and then they could say, uh, we have no evidence, we don't want to do anything because we completely destroyed their case while they put it on. Or sometimes if, if a plaintiff does not make the case because we have the burden of proof, at the end of our evidence, the defendants, the companies we sue, could make a motion for what's called a directed verdict after we put our case on and say, Judge, they never proved their case. I shouldn't even have to get up here in front of this jury because they never proved their case. And sometimes if a if a, if a plaintiff's lawyer doesn't put on the right case, that case can get dismissed before it even gets to a defendant. So we have the burden, and so we take our burden very seriously. So we have to make sure to meet all those elements with the experts. But uh, one other thing Andy said, all the experts that he talked about, keep in mind the defendants have their own slew of experts that are going to say just the opposite thing. It's amazing. One would think at this, this day and age, and how we all, all the things we know about asbestos, how anybody how anybody could say under oath that asbestos or the asbestos in this company's product is not hazardous. It amazes me. I've been doing this for 30 years, and it astounds me that a, that a, that a company or, or a defense lawyer can get up and try to convince a jury that a product of theirs that contained asbestos didn't hurt this person or didn't contribute to, to this person's disease. And they do, and they'll have experts that say it. And we have to deal with a jury. Now, uh, on, you know, if the jury was made up of folks like you and we're all very knowledgeable about these things, we'd have no problem. But most jurors aren't thinking about asbestos or mesothelioma. In fact, when we pick a jury, and this goes for both sides, we go through a process called a voir dire. And basically it means we question the jurors to see if we have a jury made up of people that don't have any kind of real preconceived ideas. So that would mean none of you in this audience could probably pass muster on a jury of a mesothelioma case because we all know about this and have plenty of preconceived ideas about it. So by the time you get your jury, it has all been kind of uh, whitewashed to a point where these people know nothing about asbestos or about mesothelioma, and they're ready to be taught. So the defendants say, well, you know, we'll teach them. We'll teach them our way, and we'll have experts that say a certain thing our way. The, Go ahead. If I may just add Go one ahead. thing. No, we're going to take the, some questions. The litigation is not static. And what that means is that the defenses that are imposed by the defendants are anything but static. And over the last 20 to 30 years, we have seen the defenses go from we didn't know when they really did, or there wasn't anything in the literature when there really was, or our product didn't contain asbestos when it really did to defenses now that consist of this particular type of asbestos fiber that was in our product doesn't cause mesothelioma, even though every national, international organization says otherwise, and most experts on earth say otherwise, to our product is encapsulated and can't possibly release products or, or release asbestos. And for all those purposes, for all those defendants, we always have to produce and be ready to produce expert testimony because we have the burden of proof to show otherwise. So, so the landscape changes, the defendants change um, their defenses routinely, and we just have to be on top of it and prepared for any defense they may put forward. I think that underscores the importance of getting the right employment history, the right exposure history, so that you have all the, the facts uh, as ammunition when you go to trial and then you link it up with your own experts. I think right now we'll uh, take questions uh, from you folks and Kathy and Sean have 
uh, mics. Uh, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. Either uh, Kathy or Sean will come to you and give you the mic. Sir, go ahead, since you have it already. Hey, Bob and Andy. Um, hi, guys. Um, talk to everybody a little bit about what the defendants do in the uh, political process and the tort reform process to try and uh, sort of take away the rights to the justice system. An excellent question, because we, we were talking about this outside. And, uh, you know, we were talking about the fact that, you know, you go into different jurisdictions and you have different judges who will make different types of rulings. And one would hope that these judges don't have any kind of uh, political uh, uh, motivation is the wrong word, but, but a, a contact or, or things that can affect their views. But let's face it, there are conservative judges, there are liberal judges. Well, the political process has a big role in that. So if you have a Republican legislature or a Republican governor in a certain state, they're going to nominate and put on the bench Republican conservative judges who don't believe in lawsuits, let alone asbestos lawsuits, or believe that lawsuits should be limited in, uh, in how much money should be paid. In fact, there are a number of states that have caps on damages. And that, that's, that's purely legislative. The legislature decided that if you have a, a, a case and your pain and suffering, doesn't matter how long you've suffered, doesn't matter how young you are, there's a cap of $500,000 on pain and suffering. Well, you can imagine all the defendant companies want to be in that state because they've already limited their damages. And can you imagine a company operating being able to say, I can calculate what my damages are going to be. I can make whatever products I want that cause whatever damages I want because I can factor in that I'm only going to be so responsible, which means I don't really have to take much responsibility. That's what happens in the political process. Um, and we have to deal with that. We have to deal with judges that are conservative. We have to deal with legislators that are uh, affecting the rights of our, of our clients. Well, let me ask, Andy, let me ask a follow-up question, and then you can uh, go on with your own comments. How can a judge affect a trial, well, the outcome of a trial? <laughs> I want to be very careful, yeah. um, very, very careful. Um, the judge oversees all aspects of the case. Um, a judge who does not believe that a plaintiff has made or, or uh, met his burden on proof on a particular issue can take that issue away. And if the plaintiff in his side of the case, as Bob said, has not met his burden of proof as seen by the judge um, in his case in chief, he can take the whole case away. Uh, certainly in asbestos, that, that's a rarity. Um, uh, and certainly there is law that every judge follows in terms of whether or not he can, quote, direct a verdict for the defendant after the plaintiff's case. And the law is such that the plaintiff has to accept, or the plaintiff, the judge has to accept everything the plaintiff basically has said is true in making his evaluation and making a determination as to whether or not the plaintiffs have made their initial uh, burden of proof, have met that, and the case can go forward. Certainly, different judges have different views of the law, and certainly different judges who are sitting and listening to evidence would have, as would any juror, have different views of the evidence. However, given the law, which is that the judge needs to take into account all facts in favor of the plaintiff in making rulings um, as to whether or not they have met a burden, um, most judges, all judges, will comply with that. And um, we certainly in Baltimore have, have not had trouble with uh, any aspect uh, working with the judges that we've had. And, I, and I gotta, I've got to say, at least in New York and New Jersey, we've been blessed with, with even-handed fair judges. But, but you never know, uh, because they, they can have, especially in, more on the appellate or even the, the higher courts, look, the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, that's a very politically, you know, you know when someone wants to, uh, a president wants to put one of their appointees on the uh, Supreme Court of the United States, if you have a, a more liberal president, you're going to end up with more liberal justices. If you have a more conservative president, you're going to have more conservative justices, and that could end up having uh, implications and, for all of us. And I think that's a fair way to put it, because in Baltimore, similarly, we have been blessed with the opportunity to have fair judges. And that's all either side can ever that's ask, is for a fair judge. And we've been able to, to have those throughout the time that we've been practicing in Maryland and, and throughout the Mid-Atlantic. Questions? Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, in my case, there was uh, 
never any discussion about going to trial. Um, my case, the, the, the origins of my exposure was so nebulous uh, that the lawyers decided to just pursue settlements, uh, which they have done, and uh, we got a, a, a number of checks back from settlements, and then all of a sudden all that stopped because of subrogation. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, who paid much of our medical bills, uh, have subrogated uh, or put in a claim for subrogation um, to, for all of their expenses, which in an effect would wipe out all the settlements that we've received so far. Um, could you speak to that? I'll let you start. Um, I would, again, I, I don't want to talk about your case because we're not allowed to talk about your case uh, since you, you're represented. Um, what I would say generically is that any lawyer needs to look at any situation with any plaintiff and make determinations what is in his, the interests of his client. And you look at the facts before you, especially when it is at a posture, a case is in a posture where it can be resolved or it's coming up for a trial at which time the court is going to be holding settlement conferences, for instance. And at that time, the lawyer and those working with him have to evaluate the case, determine the opportunity of success against any one of the number of defendants that may be in the case and make certain evaluations as to whether or not a case should proceed to trial against a particular defendant, whether or not there should be an attempt to settle with that defendant, and if so, what is the value of the case with that particular defendant. So it really, those types of things are very, very much case specific and I'm sure Bob feels the same way. That's the way we always evaluate cases individually as, as a client would expect. Uh, that's good. Oh, no, I understand that. I understand. I really was just trying to be generic in my answer without being specific Caution to you. Regarding the, the union for yeah, case. every case is unique. And, uh, and that's why I, I certainly, whenever I have a client come in, I certainly don't ever give them any kind of expectations or certainly false expectations. And it may turn out after a very long process there really isn't much that can be done. And, and we're as frustrated as anybody else when, it, when, when you can't really make a case no matter how hard you try. And sometimes you can try to get some settlements with defendants, but you make an evaluation and then it's a teamwork. You, you speak to your client, you talk about, does it make sense to go to trial? A trial can be an expensive proposition. What are the chances of success? If the case is a very weak one, does it make more sense to maybe try to settle it out? Look strong, but understand the weaknesses of the case and see if you can try to resolve the case. Now, you did bring up a very good point, and we're finding this more and more, not just with Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and, and those kind of subrogation, but uh, lately, over the last year or two, another thing that's held up settlements uh, on behalf of plaintiffs generally in asbestos litigation is uh, Medicare subrogation. Uh, Medicare, of course, needs money, and they, they've come to the conclusion that they can uh, if people are getting Medicare, and a lot of people with asbestos uh, disease uh, who are older and, uh, and have gotten their um, health uh, care covered by Medicare, Medicare can come back and, um, and seek to be compensated for what they spent and what they paid out. Uh, and it can really uh, hold back trying to get the case resolved because unlike Blue Cross Blue Shield, the government can really put uh, a stop on things until all of the Medicare issues are resolved. So they want to make sure that they get paid before anybody else gets paid. And so the defendants are concerned about, because they're on the hook, if the defendant doesn't make sure the government's paid, they could be responsible. So they don't necessarily want to pay either. Well, let me ask you a question yeah. about it. Will, I know that some of the carriers will negotiate uh, a discount Yes. Uh, in regarding how they much do. is out and how much they want to get paid. Does Medicare do that? Medicare will do that. But uh, is there, there a formula? There's not really a formula, no. but but Medicare will do it. Uh, but it is the government, so you know it's like, can, can you can you go to the government and say, well, I want to try to uh, talk about how much taxes I owe? It's it's a little tougher when you're dealing with the government. Mm -hmm. They say you owe us this, pay or or, or everyone's going to be fined. So we try to all work together, and this is where we do work with the defendants, and we do work with the insurance companies that we've already settled with. So once you settle with the company in a particular case, okay, now we're friends, pay us the money. Oh, wait a minute, Medicare is saying that I'm responsible unless the Medicare lien is paid. But sometimes the government won't even tell us the extent of the Medicare lien. 
So they say, well, we're not going to pay until we know what it is. So it does complicate factors. And, and we have, just to give you an idea, in our law firm now, we have a whole section of people dealing only with Medicare issues. Two years ago, I didn't have one employee dealing with that issue. So we, we understand there's an issue. We want to we wanna comply with the Medicare laws, and we want to be able to expedite payment to our clients, but it, it ends up meaning that more people have to work on that. Yeah, and we too now have individuals who are, are dedicated almost full time to working on Medicare issues in our office. Yeah. Uh, so they create a job, the government's happy. See, that's yeah. right. <laughs> Question. Um, I'm curious about the product liability insurers and what their role is. Um, I'm sure that the, the manufacturers of these asbestos containing material products had uh, you know, product liability insurance, and so what's their role? The insurers are, are those who are, who are primarily calling the shots for the defendants. Mm -hmm. uh, when we sue a particular company in a particular case and there's a time for negotiation, uh, it is the insurer that is calling the shot for that company. It is not the company itself unless for some reason it's self-insured. Um, so it may be company X that is the defendant on the lawsuit and it is company X that is being represented by a, law, a defense lawyer, but it is the insurer that's paying for all of the defense and will ultimately, if the case resolves, or if it goes to trial and there's a verdict, they're the ones who are ultimately gonna pay. So they are very primarily involved, if behind the scenes, because we don't deal with them directly, we deal with them through their lawyers who represent their client. There's been an evolution of uh, identified defendants in asbestos litigation over the last 40 years or so. Absolutely. Where, where, where does it stand today? Because uh, defendants have come and gone. There's some small ones, some very large ones. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, it, look, I've been doing this since 1980. I know I started when I was very, very young, 10 years old. But anyway, uh, that, uh, that, was, that was Dr. Sturman's joke, but I stole it from him. <laughs> but uh, the fact is, uh, it has really evolved in terms of the the kinds of exposures and the kinds of defendants that are sued. In the old days, we most of the cases came out of the shipyards, mm -hmm. uh, and they were both asbestosis, lung cancer, and mesothelioma cases. People who worked, uh, and, and ships are full of asbestos, especially the warships, the Navy ships, and we still represent uh, naval uh, employees, guys who worked on these ships when they were overhauled and such. But we were, and I know you guys certainly did shipyard workers to start too, and there were a whole slew of, of companies that made insulation products like cement and block and, and pipe covering that was asbestos containing. Um, some of those companies, as a matter of fact, a lot of those companies have gone bankrupt. And so we look further at to what other kinds of exposures there are. And we found, also maybe because of the latency period, um, you know, starting in the 60s and 70s, there were other kinds of products that had asbestos in them. And I'm astounded to this day, still learning of products that had asbestos in them. Uh, one product, and, and, and I've got uh, Brendan Tully from my office, and he's working on this case right now. Uh, it's a product that we all know. Uh, it's a fertilizer product, Turf Builder. Well, Turf Builder, and we had a client, and we were puzzled by what's her exposure. I just couldn't understand it. And by the way, I know that at the medical panel, someone said there are a lot more women developing mesothelioma. Mm -hmm. Well, why is that? Not, they weren't on the shipyards, but we're finding there are a lot of products that women either would have used or they could have been exposed to their husband's clothing when he came home and they washed the clothing. But we found, for instance, a product that was a fertilizer product used in the gardens, and that product had a vermiculite base. Well, vermiculite's also not asbestos. But, but looking further, vermiculite is contaminated with asbestos. Vermiculite is mined in a certain mine, and the contamination in vermiculite can be up to 30% asbestos. It's not even considered an asbestos-containing product, and it's not used for the purposes of, you know, the, the, the qualities of asbestos. But asbestos contaminates the product, which we learn, and we're investigating that right now. So we're, we're running into a whole slew of new kinds of products that indeed did have asbestos that I wouldn't have even realized had asbestos if we hadn't looked. Well, there's been a lot of discussion over the years about latency period, and I think you mentioned it in your earlier uh, comments. Does that, 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 that comes into play directly, doesn't it? 
in uh, meso litigation and exposure history? It, it does. Um, and as I said, you know, the latency barrier could be anywhere between 10 and 60 years. So uh, there's a pretty large window of, of the kinds of exposures people can have. But maybe you're leading to this question, Kirk, which is possible, that as we go further in time, and I think the companies and the insurers are all hoping this too, they, do, they have all their bean counters. They're calculating how far into the future will this asbestos litigation go and how, how much longer we have to keep paying money. And the fact is, um, mesotheliomas are still on the rise. Right. But exposure to asbestos is certainly much, much lower. And that's because of lawsuits that started many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. That as soon as people realized that they were going to be responsible for the asbestos in their products, they took the asbestos out of their products. And the exposure to asbestos has decreased significantly. However, we're still learning that maybe there was asbestos in products that no one ever thought there was. But I think in general, the, the, the kinds of exposures we're seeing will be dropping. But the mesotheliomas will still be rising for a while because of the latency period. So we're still dealing with people who were exposed in the 60s still coming to a rise. There will come a point, though, where that will drop too, I truly believe. Yeah, we're seeing the same thing, and we're experiencing uh, issues involving when products uh, no longer contained asbestos. And we're surprised to find sometimes that products that we thought would be asbestos-free, by, certainly by the 1970s with OSHA, and with the general knowledge out there about asbestos hazards, certain products of certain manufacturers were continuing to contain asbestos until easily into the early 1980s. Um, somewhat shocking at times, but that's sometimes what we've discovered. Question. Yes, sir. Kathy, right, right, right off the front here. Sean? Oh, okay. You want me to go first? Good afternoon. I'm, I've got a, more of a statement question that um, I've known Bob and Andy for years, and um, I've been litigating also since I was 10 years old, and my firm's been <laughs> involved in, we're in since we're the, in elementary school trying our first case together. <laughs> since the 1970s. But one of the things I wanted to stress the importance when you're talking about law firms and what they do, um, how important it is that your firm also has that team approach. We've heard a lot today about the nurses and physician assistants and having a team. And one of the things that we do, and I think you all do the same thing, is if your lawyer doesn't communicate back to you, then you don't have the right law lawyer or the right firm. We make sure we have paralegals who know the, the work, who are compassionate, who actually um, get very, very, very close to a lot of our clients. And just want to comment on not only having the right lawyer that can go in and litigate against the big companies and the right lawyer to negotiate, but just having the right team so that you can be available at all different areas. If you could just touch you on bring that. A, you bring a good point up because uh, you had asked earlier, Kirk, you know, how, how do you pick the right lawyer or right law firm? And, and it is important. Experience and knowledge is important. But what kind of staff, what kind of group do they have? Uh, come meet the lawyer. Come, come to their office. Come see the people working on your case. Because one thing we pride ourselves on is we, within the firm, we have a team approach. We have, we've, we'll have maybe one lawyer assigned to the case, but that lawyer is not on an island by himself. He's dealing with other lawyers. Question. We're constantly talking about our cases with each other and making sure that all the issues that come up can be covered you know, in other cases as well. We also have paralegals that, that are constantly working on, on developing the case. We have investigators uh, who, who go out, like detectives, to try to find that witness. It's essential that you have a law firm like that. And I'll tell you why. Because the defendants have it. And the defendants have unlimited resources. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. They just will spend money to defeat you. And they'll make a calculation. If I can spend X dollars to get this case knocked out, it's worth it, rather than have these guys maybe hitting big. So you've got to be prepared with the right team to represent you. And giving out a cell number is, is, is an awfully good thing to do, and it's something that a client should ask for, and it's something that we believe a, an attorney should be willing to provide at any given time. When, when we have a client coming in our office with a new mesothelioma case, we make sure we give that individual our cell numbers because the last thing on planet Earth we want is for that person to leave our office after the first time they've met us or the 20th time they've met us and have questions 
after they leave and not be able to have access to us. They have enough going on in their lives that the legal process, we believe, shouldn't be one of those things that are causing them any more heartache. Amen. And uh, that's pretty important when it comes to mesothelioma and these types of cases to seek a law firm that A, has the experience and the ability to, and the investigative ability uh, to pursue the case, but also understands what's going on with you as their client. Well, I, I think that's why they talked about anxiety and the lawyer's responsibility to reduce anxiety and to give the, the client some control over what's happening in his or her case. Uh, I think there was a question up front here. Kim. Yeah, we'd like to take two more, Kirk. There's this gentleman and there's one more, so sure. then, we're, then we're gonna need to wrap it up because it'll Very be good. five, thanks. My question is, um, first of all, how can asbestos-related companies that have declared bankruptcy continue to, to reduce the payment amounts, the percentage of the value of the claim? For example, recently a bankrupt company said that the value of the claim was $275,000, so the victim or person's life, plaintiff's life, was worth that much uh, with the bankruptcy trust, that they were, you know, that was the value in the consent form and the settlement form and everything, but you get down in the fine print and they say, uh, we're sorry, but we can only pay a percentage of that. The percentage of this claim and the value of the life at 275000 they were going to pay less than one half of one percent or thirteen hundred dollars you deduct the the attorney fees in this case it was 45 percent the plaintiff ended up in less expenses on top of that ended up with six hundred fifty dollars from a claim that initially was valued at two hundred seventy five thousand in the big picture when the victims such as myself we see on television to this day the claims from law firms and attorneys that say that there's this huge fund valued at $30 billion, $30 billion to dole out, you know, to pay victims. And uh, so I'm wondering with the increase in claimants over time, especially from 9-11 and, you know, an increase such as that, why do they continue each quarter of the year <laughs> reduce the percentage of the payment amount? Is it based on the economy of the, you know, the bankruptcy trust, it, you know, that's set aside to pay. So it's not the, the health, economic health of the company because it's a bankruptcy trust. The company's gone bankrupt. Complicated question. It is, and if, if Kathy's giving us little time to answer, it's, 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 it's got a lot of, unfortunately, layers that we can try to deal with. But we are very frustrated by the, by the bankruptcy trust as well. But here's, here's a problem, and, and it's, it's the first term used, bankruptcy. When a company goes into bankruptcy, a lot of times they don't pay any claims. Um, with, the, with the asbestos trust, a lot of these companies went bankrupt and were able to kind of use the system uh, and continue to operate to this day, yet they formed a trust and they put money in that trust. And at the time, it was calculated the money, uh, how many claims would there be and how much should be paid, and that's where that number comes in. This is not something lawyers necessarily decided was the amount, but the bankruptcy trust decide, well, a claim is an average claim, and that's the problem. They deal with averages now. They're no longer looking at individuals yeah. whatsoever. An average claim against us in the court system over 30 years would be, let's say, $275,000. Now, how many claimants do we have? They add it up. Three million that could be potential claimants, not only presently, but they look into the future because this bankruptcy trust is supposed to um, compensate not only the people that are present when the company goes bankrupt, but all the people in the future that may develop disease. So they have to calculate what, what do we need. Now, the company's bankrupt, so they don't have that much money put into a trust. So they say, all we can afford to put in this trust is Let's say they say $50 million, sounds like a lot of money. But when they calculate that the claims are each $275,000 a piece and X million people may make those claims, they calculate their payment percentage based on how much money they can actually put into the trust. So the payment percentage could be 5% and sometimes as low as 1% or less. So you don't, don't uh, feel that because they have valued you at $275,000 or then at 0.1%,
that any value has been put on you or your lives. It's just, it's, it's a myth, it's something that is calculated that we all unfortunately have to deal with. Andy, and, and I think we have very little control over that. We have, uh, I stole the words from me, we, we as plaintiff's lawyers have virtually no control over that. It's not targeted to you individually. This is done on a, on a national basis. It's done on an actuarial basis where every so often for each of these trust funds that have been set up, uh, they will economically analyze how many claims they've been getting in, how much does the trust fund have available, uh, based on the economy, how much does the trust fund, do they think the trust fund is going to be getting in in any given period of time, what do they think in terms of the numbers of people who will be making claims at any given time, and then they make those calculations on any set number of, uh, of, of times a year. But I do want to emphasize, you're right, Kurt, plaintiffs and plaintiffs' attorneys have very, very, very limited control over this process. We really, unfortunately, don't. I think this presentation shows you why I call these guys gunfighters or gunslingers, because that's exactly what they are, and that's exactly what you need when you're in court. Thanks, everyone. Wait, wait one second. Oh. We, we've got one, two really quick two, questions. Two, one really quick question, then, yes, just we're really quick. We're, we're, we're <laughs> but then, then we have to exit the room very fast, which I'll explain in a second. I just have a quick question. How many patients contact lawyers and if they do contact you, um, how many win their suit? I'm sorry, like, I didn't, you didn't hear it. Part of the suit, the how question. many win their suit? How many patients contact lawyers? Is there a sorry. percentage? I don't know if there's, I, I wouldn't know of a percentage. Mm -hmm. What I would suggest to you is that, and this is a guess, um, so let's leave it at that, but I would suggest to you that most people who are diagnosed with mesothelioma, um, if for no other reason than, than advertising that's now out there nationwide, at some point in time are going to contact a lawyer, whether or not it be their own lawyer who will refer them on to someone else or not. But that's not true of, anyone, of everyone, unfortunately, uh, because we believe that everybody who has mesothelioma should have representation and representation by a qualified attorney. As far as the second part of your question, how many of them win their lawsuit, most of the cases nationwide resolve. There are lawsuits. Well, that could be considered a win, by the way. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so everybody Then we win an awful lot of the time. Um, the but sometimes okay. cases do um, have to go to trial. Certainly our office and Bob's office on occasion have to go to trial against one or more defendants in any particular case where we will talk to our client and say, look, we believe that this case against this particular defendant, given the circumstances, given the offer, given what we know of the facts and the exposure, it's not enough. We need to go to trial. Um, that happens. How often it happens nationwide as compared to settlements of cases, I really couldn't guess. Most cases do resolve. Another question, Kathy? One more. This is the last question. It's me over here. What is your feeling um, as lawyers and advocates, not just for your clients and winning settlements, but giving that money back to fund research to support, you know, foundations such as this, to which is ultimately really going to help people and save lives because no amount of money or settlement is ever going to bring back the people excellent, that have gone. Excellent, idea. excellent question. Excellent question. Um, obviously, that's why Andy and I are here. We, you know, we want to put the money back in. We put our money where our mouth is. We want to make sure, and I think this is the organization to do it in. People donate and do things. This organization, I am so thrilled to be able to tell a client, because a lot of times clients who don't know about the Mesothelium Foundation or support groups, they come to us for, you know, they go to the doctors and they come to us for, for medical uh, and uh, for legal advice, and I am so thrilled that I can send them when they say, is there somewhere I can go? Yes, there is. And what's going on with the research? Not only will I tell you, let me tell you who to call. Here's Mary Estorfer's number. Here's, and, and, and then I also tell people, I can't ever, you know, uh, tell them how to spend their money. I never would even suggest to people how to spend their money. But I tell them how I spend my money. And a lot of my clients, one of the great things about being able to get compensation for people is to make a difference in their lives. But it also allows them, when they wouldn't have been in a position like that before, to make a difference in other people's lives, which is what I think motivates us mm -hmm. to continue the hard work in doing these lawsuits. Yeah, we, well we, we, we think it is absolutely yeah. essential to support organizations such as MARF, and, and we are really so pleased to be involved with MARF, 
and to also support other medical institutions, which we do certainly in the Maryland, throughout the Maryland area, who are doing research on mesothelioma, uh, who are treating our patients, our clients, as patients in their institutions. And uh, I think generically it, it, it's significant for anyone involved in this litigation as attorneys uh, to do so. I want to just thank you three gentlemen so much. Didn't they do a great job? And 